Okay, good morning everybody. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Laura Phillips. I'm the Senko at Malmesbury Primary School. Um, so my role is to coordinate all of the additional support that goes on um, within the school. And that ranges from speech and language therapy to support with emotional needs, to support with uh, learning difficulties, neurodiversity. Um, so it covers a whole, a whole range of um, strengths and differences, I suppose. Um, so this session is a little bit of a kind of whistle stop tour of dyslexia, a bit of information about um, what dyslexia is, um, how we go about identifying those needs in our pupils, uh, what's out there in terms of support for parents, um, and a bit of signposting um, as to where you can access different uh, uh, types of support as parents, uh, helping your children navigate through um, their education. So um, I'm going to share my screen. There's a couple of videos um, and a little bit of, sort of information from me. I have a habit of talking really quickly, so I'm going to try really hard to um, stay, stay um, slower paced. Um, if you do have any uh, questions, if you can just keep a note of them and I'll try and open the chat box at the end when I've stopped recording. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, if not, if I, if I manage to make a mess of that, then just email me at the end because it's all a bit complicated. OK, I'm going to share my screen. Let's get going. So the plan for this session, what is dyslexia? So I'm going to explain a little bit about what it, what it actually means. Um, lots of people assume it's just difficulties with spelling and reading and maybe reversing B's and D's, but there's a lot more to it than that. So a little bit of an explanation around what is dyslexia. Um, if you think your child is dyslexic or is presenting with some of those difficulties, what can you do to help and support them? So through the chat, um, I'll discuss a bit more about some of those kinds of signs and symptoms and then signpost you as to what you can do if you think um, your child might be displaying some of those needs. Um, for those of you that are fairly confident that your child is dyslexic, you've, you've been kind of observing them over time. Uh, you've got a, quite a good idea of, of where their strengths lie and where their differences are. Um, but you want to know, you want a definitive diagnosis. I can talk a little bit about that um, and what that looks like in Wiltshire and where you can go if that's something you want to explore. Uh, lots of chat about resources, strategies, things on the website um, that you can access. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And questions and ideas, and that's something when I've stopped recording at the end, if anybody wants to pop any sort of ideas or questions in the chat, we'll have a, we'll have a um, conversation about that at the end. Okay, so what is, what is dyslexia? And here's a little video to get us started. Hopefully the technology works. Your brain is amazing, and nobody else has one quite like it. Although everybody's brain looks the same, they all work differently from each other. Just as we all have different color skin, hair, and eyes, we all have a brain that's individual to us, like a fingerprint. We have different personalities, tastes, strengths, and weaknesses. Our brains can even see and understand the world in different ways. One of those ways is called dyslexia which affects how the brain handles information it sees and hears. Dyslexic people may find it difficult to match letters to sounds and to remember how to spell words. They may even see letters moving around when they're reading. They might have trouble telling left from right. Remembering lots of instructions can be especially hard. They may need more thinking time to remember the right word. No, wait. As well as memorizing sequences. It may be difficult for them to hold a pencil and to write by hand. Even organizing themselves can be difficult. But everyone with dyslexia is different. It can affect how people feel about themselves. 
When they struggle with a task that other people find easy, they may feel frustrated, angry, or sad. Some dyslexic people try to hide their difficulties because they are worried about what others will think of them. However, thinking differently can be a really good thing. A person with dyslexia may be very good at seeing patterns and solving problems, imagining and rotating objects in their heads, telling stories and making people laugh, taking things apart, understanding how they work, and figuring out how to put them together again. Inventing, drawing, painting, and making things. Seeing the bigger picture. Dyslexic people can do a lot of things. They just might do them in a different way to how others would, and many of them have even become famous for it. There have been many famous dyslexic inventors, writers, scientists, business people, astronomers, paleontologists, actors, cooks, singers, artists, architects, and so on. Dyslexic people have changed the world. See dyslexia differently. Okay, um, I use that video a lot with children. Um, and I think I did a presentation like this a couple of years ago um, now. And um, I use that video then. It's one of the best ones out there. It's great to share with children. Um, and it really hammers home that message that um, dyslexia, it, it, if you're dyslexic, it's not a measure of your intelligence, far from it actually. And that's something I talk to children about a lot. Um, I forgot to mention at the beginning, we are a dyslexia friendly school. Uh, we achieved the Dyslexia Friendly Award in July 2022. Um, so it's something I'm really passionate about. I'm passionate about not to lose the momentum on raising awareness um, and also ensuring children who do have those learning differences feel confident about themselves and really understand their strengths. It's uh, really, really important. Okay, key facts. There's no single type um, of dyslexia. That's really important. Dyslexia covers a wide range of difficulties and is unique, unique for every individual. Uh, dyslexia causes difficulty in the school skills needed to read, to spell and write, but it's often much used with organization, um, forgetting what somebody's told them um, or somebody's name, uh, memorizing numbers, times table facts. They can be really, really tricky to recall for children who are dyslexic. So it's not just about difficulties with reading and spelling. Um, it can be thing in terms of their organization, getting things ready for school in the morning, remembering what to put in their bag. It, it can impact lots of areas of, of organization as well. Okay, key fact number two, it's not, it's not a disease, it's a neurodiversity, it's neurological. Um, there's no medicine that can cure dyslexia. Uh, the brain works differently. Um, uh, having dyslexia does not mean you lack intelligence. Um, uh, a good analogy to use with children is explaining uh, everybody's brain is like a computer um, that's being put to work on different tasks. And, and, and somebody with a, a dyslexic brain, their computer's designed slightly differently. So some of the tasks it's being asked to do, it's not what their computer's desi best designed for. So it's just about rethinking. Um, you can't fix dyslexia, that's really important as well. It's not something you can um, be cured of, if that makes sense. Okay, early identification is really important. And by that, I don't mean getting a formal diagnosis. I mean, getting a better understanding of what is going on for that child and what the barriers to learning are for them. Um, I talked a lot, a lot, I talked to parents a lot about uh, the pros and cons of getting a diagnosis, because absolutely it is useful to know whether you're child is or whether your child isn't but far more useful is understanding what works for your child in terms of their learning and what doesn't work for your child um, and building up that profile that learning profile and understanding is far more powerful um, and far more useful to the child and the parents and to us actually at school 
Um, it's really also important to eliminate any other barriers that might be going on. So the starting point is always when was when was um, your child's hearing last checked? When did they last have a sight test? Eliminating all those um, other areas first before you start kind of pinpointing um, what's going on in terms of their barriers to learning. Um, when uh, when a formal diagnosis is 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 carried out, it analyzes your your a child's strengths and weaknesses, um, and a weakness in a specific learning skill can indicate the type of dyslexia that the child has. So there's a wide range of um, difficulties under that kind of dyslexia umbrella. So you may hear words like auditory processing difficulties or visual memory deficit. Um, so it's not just yes this person is dyslexic no this person isn't what you would get with a formal diagnosis is a more detailed breakdown of the different areas um, of dyslexia and, and which areas that particular child is stronger or weaker in for us in school we don't formally diagnose dyslexia but we have lots of tools and resources where we start to analyze what's working and what isn't working for a child um, and that helps us to fine tune um, our resources um, and provision to make sure it's best meeting the needs of the children. Okay encouraging children to believe in themselves and that they can succeed. Um, unfortunately, um, our education system is, is quite formal in lots of ways. There's a high expectation of being able to read, being able to write in full sentences, being able to hold lots of information in your head for tests. Um, and we know that, you know, children and young people with dyslexia, that is that can be a challenge for them. Um, and so an impact of that, when you, particularly when you get to year five and six, is you can um, encounter children who are lacking confidence and, and feel that they're not um, a, as good as the person sitting next to them in something. Because the way that we measure uh, uh, progress in lots of ways is quite formal. Um, this is something that um, going through that Dyslexia Friendly Schools Award, this was a big part of um, our uh, application, I guess, is, is looking at what we do to celebrate difference. Um, and it's something that we uh, have continuing to develop. So I'll give you an example of that. We have um, a team of learning champions in year six, and they're made up of a group of children who may or may not be dyslexic, but they may they like to learn differently. So they might be particularly creative musical sporty um, they've got some great ideas for their writing great ideas for their learning but actually sometimes the getting it written down can be quite challenging for them so we we spend a lot of time during the course of the year talking about resources talking about alternative methods of technology that children can use in class to record their ideas talking about ways in which um, we can give those children time to shine. So we had a group of year six learning champions last year, and I've just recru recruited my new bunch for this year. Um, so we'll be doing lots of work on that um, as the year progresses. We also do lots of work on growth mindset, uh, encouraging children to understand that they do have to put the work in. You know, if a child does have a dyslexia diagnosis, it's not an excuse. Um, it's a it's an identification that they may need to learn in a slightly different way, that certain reasonable adjustments might need to be made, but they still need to work hard. And in some cases, they need to work harder. So it's making sure that these children have good levels of resilience, that we're supporting them to develop their resilience, but also that um, we can help them develop a positive growth mindset um, and giving them the confidence to ask for help. That's a really important part of what we do at Malmesbury Primary School as well. Um, ensuring that when children leave us in year six, they go off to secondary school equipped with a little toolkit of resources and strategies, but also the confidence to speak out and ask for help if they need it. Uh, those of you with older children will know that secondary school runs in a very different way to primary school. So it's our job to kind of empower children to have the confidence to speak up for themselves as well. And that's a big part of what we do within the Dyslexia Friendly Schools um, programme that we deliver in school. Okay, developing strategies. It's people with dyslexia don't remember just by seeing and hearing a word a few times, they can forget. 
um, a rule and a strategy, but, but a rule or strategy provides a way of working it out. So it's helping children to know what works for them. So I'll give you an example. In the classroom, teachers quite often display the content of their lessons on their interactive whiteboards. And for some children with those kind of visual processing difficulties, looking at a whiteboard and then looking down at their page can be really difficult for them. It's almost like they have to look up several times to even hold a little piece of that information. So lots of children use iPads to take a photograph of a slide that's on the board and then they have that iPad next to them on the desk and then they're just looking across, glancing across and that can make a huge difference in terms of uh, making sure we're reducing that cognitive load on children that um, have those visual or processing difficulties. And that's really important as well. <clears throat> Other things that we have in terms of resources, we have lots of visual word banks. We have little dictaphones that children can use to record their ideas for sentences so that then they don't have to hold that sentence in their head. They can play it back several times, even one word at a time, so that they can break that sentence down. Planning tools for writing. So we don't expect any child actually to sit down and write a story from scratch every class there's always an element of planning and for some children that planning needs to be more visual they may prefer to draw out the story in like a cartoon strip storyboard kind of approach or break each paragraph into little boxes so they've got bullet points for each paragraph written in each box so we we, we offer lots of different um alternative uh tools to children um and then and we, we like to get that feedback from the child as to what works for them and that works at a very very basic level even with the very little ears in year one they're planning stories at the moment and they're drawing out pictures for the beginning the middle and the end of their story so it's something we introduce really really early on okay what do we do in school so for teachers, um, and this is something I had a staff meeting last night, actually, uh, with a focus on um, additional needs. And we talked a little bit about the dyslexia friendly classroom. And actually, it's not about tweaking teachers practice for those children that are in their class that may be dyslexic. Good quality first teaching is dyslexia friendly and it's something all children would benefit from so making sure that slides that you're showing children in your lessons are not busy and cluttered with lots of text that it's broken up with pictures that it's quite visual um, making sure that you're being mindful of how much information children can hold in one in one go um, we're doing lots of work on cognitive overload at the moment that's something that we talked about yesterday as well uh, classrooms from year two to year six also have orange, what we call help yourself boxes in the classroom. So they are little uh, kits of resources. So things like highlighter pens, post-it notes, notebooks, dictaphones, uh, pencil grips, uh, coloured overlays, lots of things that children can dip into and use to support in their learning. And with the very younger children, Lots of those resources need to be modelled to them by the adults in the classroom. But further up the school, when you get to kind of year fives and sixes, we're really encouraging them to dip into those boxes and, and take out what works for them or give something a try. And if it doesn't work, don't use it again. But with the littler children, we're absolutely modelling some of those tools to them and to expose them to them. We do have some touch typing going on. So for children who are dyslexic or struggle with that kind of formal method of recording, we do have touch typing that goes on in year fives and year sixes. Um, and then in year five and six, offering access to a laptop for those longer pieces of writing. Not exclusively, it's still really important. Children are writing, obviously, um, but sometimes just taking the pressure off. Um, giving them the capacity to have a spell checker on um, and to use some of those editing tools that you get with software packages can be really helpful. And we do see a difference, actually, in, in sometimes the quality uh, of, the, of, the, of the work that's produced on computer and also the quantity. Uh, sometimes children's typing skills are actually um, because the, 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 the physicality of the writing has been taken away they produce a lot more and they're more ambitious with their vocabulary choices as well when they know that the spell check is there to help them sometimes children can play it safe with their vocab choices when they're having to work out how to spell those words as well if that makes sense 
Okay. And lots of visuals in the classroom um, and getting that balance between having lots of visuals there to prompt children and not overloading children with too many visuals. It's a very tough balance. Classrooms are busy, colourful places, and sometimes that can be a bit of an overload for children. So it's making sure that the things that we've got on our walls are the most important bits of information for the children and they're useful. OK. Uh, does my child have dyslexia? Some possible warning signs. OK, so in reading, um, immediately forgetting what they've just read. So they've read a sentence, um, they go back and you ask them something about what they've just read and they can't remember, although they have to go back and reread it again. Um, another example is if they've uh, stumbled on a word, let's say it was elephant, in, uh, on a page in their book. You've worked it out together and then that same word appears on the next page and it's like they're seeing it for the first time. That's a real, um, uh, can be a dyslexia indicator. Um, these aren't exclusive to dyslexia. You know, that could be a child that's had a really busy day and is tired. Um, that could be a child that actually um, hasn't had their eyes tested for a while. So please don't think that if you read this and you're mentally ticking these off that your child is dyslexic. There's a lot more to it than that. But it's worth being um, aware of some of those warning signs. So a reading speed. So children who process information at a slower rate may read at a slower speed. Um, it doesn't mean that they're not capable readers. They're decoding the words really well. They're just reading at a slower pace. While reading, missing out words or missing off the ends of words, um, that, can be a, that can be a dyslexia indicator. Um, forgetting what I've just read. I've just repeated myself. It's like I've forgotten as well. Um, struggling with fluency. So lots of sounding out that indicates um, a weak phonological awareness. Um, so by that, I mean the, the phonics that they've been taught in school. They're not able to draw upon that knowledge automatically when they're reading. So when phonics is at that acquisition stage, they're being exposed to the phonics. And in those sessions, they may be able to recall those initial sounds or those digraphs or those trigraphs. But when they um, uh, come across those same digraphs and trigraphs within text, within a sentence, it's not automatic. It's not they're not able to draw on that knowledge. They require more overlearning, more exposure to it. A uh, weak phonological awareness can be um, a key dyslexia indicator, actually. It's something that's almost that initial question mark is around, OK, reception in year one, they're, they're having a lot of extra support with their phonics and it's just not sticking. That's often where I come in at and start doing some of that exploration. Becoming quickly tired while reading. Yawning is a real classic. Um, they're having to work extra hard when they're reading. Um, and sometimes, again, it could be they've had a busy day, but that some children, children who are dyslexic or have a dyslexic profile, even if you're reading first thing in the morning after a couple of pages, they may start to yawn. They're having to work really, really hard to decode. OK. And also be mindful that actually if a child is experiencing some of those um, challenges above, um, you could end up with a reluctant reader on your, on your hands. So making sure you're taking the pressure off in that instance. So sharing stories, listening to stories is still value in being read too. Paired reading is a great approach where you read simultaneously, particularly if the um, child is tired or they've had a busy week, reading at exactly the same time. And that way when they tire or they stumble on a word, you can keep the pace up and they jump back in when they're ready. That's a great strategy to use. Okay, spelling. Um, this is probably the area where I have most conversations with parents is around spelling, maybe a frustration with um, uh, child spellings or they're getting their spellings right every week. But then the following week, they've all disappeared again. And it's that acquisition. They're still at that acquisition stage. They need little and often um, and keep revisiting some of those common offending spellings as well. 
forgetting how to spell a word they've learned before. So they got 10 out of 10 in week one. And by week three, five of those words have dropped out because they've been given another set of words to learn. Um, and it's really difficult in schools because the national curriculum gives each year group a set of words that they have to teach the children during the course of the year. And for dyslexic learners, the pace is fast and actually reducing the expectations and really focusing on those words, those high frequency words, the words they use a lot in their writing. If they can nail those it's far more important to them and those extra ones will come later um, but it, it, I do appreciate it's fast paced with those spellings and retaining them is very very difficult for dyslexic learners. Missing out letters um, and also understanding whether a child is able to go back and edit their work and check their spellings whether they don't even notice if there are letters missing that can be really tricky and if you have if your child is one of those children that actually can't spot the mistakes Having a list of those kind of common offending words next to them when they're checking. So they've got something visual to kind of cross reference against is a really good idea. Um, and also uh, being mindful of which words you're focusing on. So if they really do struggle with spelling, not picking out every single spelling, spelling error, just focusing on those high frequency words that they have um, went, you know, the ones that come up a lot, making sure that they've really got those. Phonetically spelling, um, uh, and we do lots of work in our phonics teaching um, on tricky words, so words that you can't sound out. Once an example said another one. Um, and so they are quite visual, and so it, it can be beneficial to have a little list of those displayed somewhere um, with the little wandle phonics um, scheme that we use in school we teach tricky words explicitly. So actually what we're noticing as that program's moving through with our children, um, that our tricky word recognition is, is much stronger. So that's great, it's more positive, really wonderful. Substituting, um, swapping uh, certain sounds. Now, again, this could be an indicator of some speech and language difficulties, difficulties around speech clarity. Equally, um, if we've explored that avenue, it could be, um, checking their, their phonic understanding and also checking their sound knowledge. Difficulty with sight words, again, those, those tricky words that you have to learn on sight. Adding E onto the ends of words can be a dyslexia indicator um, because there are so many words in the English language that do require a, a kind of silent E on the end. Sometimes children get into the habit of, oh, I think they might, I'm going to stick one on anyway. So um, that can be an indicator. Um, and just using the wrong combinations of letters to spell words. Okay, writing. This is a really common one, having lots of fantastic ideas and it just not being reflected on the page. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we use a lot of, we're using technology more and more actually. Um, we've got children in here who use year six who are using voice to text software for their more uh, creative pieces of writing. We've got children who are using programs such as Clicker um, that kind of write whole words for them, just a click of a button. Um, and then we've got the more traditional word processing um, activities going on, but balanced with opportunities to kind of develop their writing skills as well. It's really important that we don't throw all of our in that kind of um, technology basket, if you like, that we're giving them a variety. Taking much longer to write, producing less than other students, again, being mindful of the impact that has on self-esteem and self-worth, worth, particularly in the classroom. If they look to their left and somebody's already written a paragraph and this, they're still trying to organise their thoughts. That can be really tricky for children, so being mindful of that. If your child writes long rambling sentences, they just keep going and going and going and going and going and not stopping to check to punctuate. Um, and then when they go back, they're really struggling to read back what they've written or they've forgotten what they've started with or they've gone off on a tangent. That can be a dyslexia indicator. Struggling to get started, the enormity of the task, the blank page in front of them, that's really common. Again, reluctant writers can also struggle with that. So it doesn't necessarily exclusively mean that's an indicator of dyslexia. Makes mistakes, omissions when writing down homework. Um, again, when we talk about strategies at secondary school, getting them to take photographs of homework slides, um, that's something the secondary school are more than happy for children to do, um, or asking for something to be on a little slip of paper to pop into their homework diary. 
remember any instructions um had a conversation with um, one of our learning champions yesterday actually because i've been thinking sometimes when my mum gives me instructions i can forget what i need to do uh and he said i didn't realize that might be because my brain works differently it's a really really powerful conversation i had yesterday so it's helping children understand that actually that that, that just means that they need something to support them with remembering things, a little checklist or um, doing one job at a time or and visuals and things. OK, other difficulties. Shoelaces, that coordination. Um, neurodiversity crosses over into lots of different areas and then coordination, organisation, um, fine motor skills can sometimes all be woven into this as well. So that's quite a common one, actually. Difficulty rhyming. Um, again, linked to that phonological awareness, syllables, rhyming, that can be deceptive indicators. Struggles with home number, uh, phone numbers, addresses, uh, times table recall. Um, again, I think I said right at the beginning, it's all often assumed that dyslexia is all about literacy skills. It has a huge impact upon ability to recall things like number bonds and number facts. Um, that can be a, a, an indicator as well. Confusing left and right and sequencing. OK, that can also be a difficulty as well. Things like the alphabet, uh, sequencing the alphabet, days of the week, months of the year, um, number sequences, all of those kinds of patterns can be really, really difficult for um, a dyslexic learner to, to kind of um, secure. Um, but with practice and with repetition, they can absolutely get there. Okay. <clears throat> So um, if you are at the point where you feel that um, you might be wanting to explore a diagnosis for my child, for your child, what does that look like? So in Wiltshire, um, I, I, I'm unable to diagnose dyslexia. So you couldn't come to me and say, can you diagnose my child? What we have in school is we have dyslexia screening tools, we have various checklists and resources that we can use to kind of build up that learning profile, what works, what doesn't work for your child, understanding their strengths and weaknesses, which are all really valuable things to do. Um, but if you would like a formal diagnosis, unfortunately, um, that is a private um, assessment, which um, you would have to pay for. So it is expensive. Um, on our uh, website, um, when you go into the learning tab, and I put the link at the end of these slides, actually, but if you go onto the school website on the learning tab, the drop down menu brings up a dyslexia friendly school page. When you open that, there is a leaflet on there, which it explains a little bit about dyslexia in Wiltshire, where those support services are some information on where um, you could go if you want to um, look into that kind of formal diagnosis. Um, I do have some contacts that I can always put you in touch with if, if that's something that you'd like to explore. What tends to happen is I tend to speak to parents about this kind of thing when they get to the top end of the school, year five and six, where parents feel confident that we've got things in place at primary school, but they want to make sure that they're going to be on secondary school's radar. Um, and just to reassure you, in terms of information sharing, if a child doesn't have a dyslexia diagnosis, a formal diagnosis, but they do have uh, a dyslexic profile, we do share that information um, with secondary schools. And in terms of things like extra time uh, in Key Stage 2 SATS tests in Year 6, you don't have to have a formal diagnosis to access the, um, those kind of additional arrangements. We uh, carry out our own in-house assessments to determine who's eligible for things like extra time, readers, scribes and things. You don't have to pay for private diagnosis to have access, access to that. Um, in terms of when uh, dyslexia can be identified, I'm always a bit wary younger than seven because children develop at different rates um, and actually children quite often, things tend to click towards the end of year one into year two. So I'm always a bit wary before the age of, of, of seven. Um, I may, I do start doing those dyslexia screening, to, uh, using those dyslexia screening tools around the age of seven, but pre-seven is about building an understanding of what works and what doesn't work. And it quite often starts um, around uh, concerns around that poor phonological awareness, poor grasp of phonics. That tends to be where our conversations start with the younger children. Um, but yeah, key stage two, juniors onwards, that tends to be a good time to start exploring that a little bit further. Um, 
We do have an educational psychologist who's linked to our school. Um, she doesn't come in and carry out dyslexia assessments. Um, she tends to work at a statutory level i.e. working with children who have educational health care plans. So sometimes uh, she would cross over and look at learning uh, as part of her role at a statutory level, but she doesn't come in and, and carry out assessments. We have advisory teachers who work at local authority who come in and support us, helping, and sometimes they come in and see children who we feel may be dyslexic. They offer strategies, they offer ideas, they speak to parents, but they do not formally diagnose. They may use terminology in their reports along the lines of has a dyslexic profile, um, uh, has dyslexic tendencies, but they will not give a definitive diagnosis. A formal diagnosis would be a detailed report, 20 pages plus, really unpicking what, what your child's strengths are. And actually that can be really empowering. It doesn't only highlight their difficulties, it really highlights to the child and to the families where they, what they're good at. And, and sometimes uh, that can be the, the, the most important part of a formal assessment actually. Okay, I think I've answered that already. Uh, they're usually independent professionals. Okay, I'm just gonna whiz through some things to remember. Lost one there. Okay, children with dyslexia um, may have good days and bad days um, for no apparent reason. Some, day, some days they may seem to be able to remember lots of information. We might think, well, goodness, we've clicked, we've got it now. Um, and then the next day it's gone. And sometimes we find in class a child may have really understood a concept in the morning, come back after lunch, and it's gone again. So it's that don't despair with the right approach, they can get there in the end. Visuals are really important. So making sure they've got prompts, support for their memory. Okay. Dyslexia affects everyone um, differently in many different ways. Um, there's been a hundred years plus of research into dyslexia, dyslexia and there's no one definition because it covers so many different areas. Um, lots of different skills are used to read um, and so that's why it's important to identify and understand an individual's learning strengths and where there is a weakness. This is, um, I think, the most recent definition we have of dyslexia. So if we're just looking at that piece in bold, characteristic features of dyslexia are difficulties in phonological awareness, verbal memory, and verbal processing speed. And it ranges across a, a range of intellectual abilities. It's not a measure of intelligence. OK, so if you think of those three main areas, phonics, so weakness in grasping basic phonic skills, difficulties with memory and remembering what's been said to them, and then processing what they've been asked to do. And that can be following sequences, um, writing a story. If you imagine the amount of processing required in, in, in writing a story is really difficult. So it's phonics, memory, processing. That's the best way to remember. With the right help, someone with dyslexia can learn to read and spell. They will never stop having dyslexia. We had so many success stories in the year six SATs last year of children uh, with dyslexia who achieved that expected standard with the right adjustments made to their provision. So the earlier we can identify and work out what's what works for a child, the, the more the more chance we've got of ensuring that child feels successful and they, they see themselves as a, as a learner. It's really important. it will take them much longer to do reading and writing tasks. Um, and it's worth remembering that, particularly when you're looking at things like homework. Um, and it's worth having that conversation with the class teacher because uh, a homework task, a teacher may be expecting a child to take 30 minutes on a piece of homework as an example, but because if your child is working uh, with uh, processing difficulties, um, it's going to take them much longer. And is that fair really? Should we be saying that actually they're gonna work really hard for those 30 minutes, the same as everybody else, and then what they've produced in those 30 minutes um, is their absolute best? Or do you decide to chunk the homework up 
into the, into chunks so that they do them in sort of 30 minute blocks or 20 minute blocks with a movement break in between so they can kind of reset their mind and be really mindful that um, it's not one size fits all and sometimes it's about making those adjustments um, particularly for children with that slow processing it, it, it's unfair to expect them to sit for an hour and a half to complete a task if actually a child without dyslexia can do that task in half an hour. Dyslexia is passed on through families. So you might have been listening to this thinking, you know what, actually, I find that really difficult. And that's something that I still struggle with today. Um, not always. We do have children in school who are presenting with a dyslexic profile and there's no family history. So it doesn't mean there has to be for us to be looking into it. Um, but being really aware and sharing that information with your child as well, explaining um, that you, you found it really tricky when you were their age and actually you found this really helpful. Um, I always use Mr Watkins as an example. Um, he is a dyslexic learner and he talks really openly about the things that he found really difficult when he was at school. And that's what makes him a fantastic teacher because he brings some of that into his teaching. We touched on this earlier, actually. Many children with dyslexia have low self-esteem and a lot of what we do is around building that resilience um, and, and making sure they understand it's not a measure of intelligence. We spend a lot of time in our learning champion sessions celebrating our strengths, actually. Um, and when I'm timetabling um, additional supports for children, I'm also looking at opportunities for art sessions for children that really like to be creative and they may find formal learning really difficult. So making sure they've got that respite and that time to shine in other areas of the day. Um, and making sure you're praising those small steps of progress. Remember, there's a big difference between progress and attainment. Attainment is how we have to measure children against their age related expectations. Progress is your journey, the journey that your child is on from their start point. So if you're seeing progress, that absolutely needs to be celebrated. There are lots of different names for dyslexia. So um, if you do end up going down a formal assessment route at any point in the future for your child. You may hear terminology such as specific learning difficulty, uh, auditory processing, um, visual processing disorder, cognitive reading disorder. Um, it's all under that dyslexia umbrella, but the, the three key areas to remember are weakness in phonics, poor memory, and difficulty processing lots of information. They are the three key indicators. People with dyslexia are often creative, we already touched upon that. Also musical, sporty. Um, we quite often use the terminology thinking outside the box, great problem solvers, great team leaders often as well, great uh, collaborators within group work. And we really see those strengths in children from a very early age actually. Um, and it's something we make a point of celebrating with those children. Okay, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, I would say going through that Dyslexia Friendly Award a couple of years ago, that was something that's really positive to come out of it, is we talk really openly about dyslexia all the time now. Um, a couple of years ago, we had some um, a team of engineers from Dyson to come, to come into school to speak to children, um, and they have a neurodiversity team there, and they were all severely dyslexic and really successful in their fields of work. And it was a really powerful discussion with children, talking, they were talking openly about what they use to help them in their jobs, uh, to prompt their memory, to help them with processing information. They also talked about things that they found difficult when they were at school. So it really empowered children. I'm going to try and do something similar this year um, for our fives and sixes, because I think it's important to keep revisiting um, and showing children that actually this isn't something just that the children experience at school. It's something adults um, deal with every day in their working life and, and are very, very successful. Okay, so in terms of questions, I'm coming to the end. I've got one video to share at the very end and then I'll stop sharing, I'll stop recording. And then if there's any questions, you can always pop them in the chat. Or alternatively, um, you can email me on my email address. Okay. Uh, that's the link to um, 
I've got a feeling that link's slightly different, actually. I think it's just Malmesbury School, Dyslexia Friendly Schools now. Um, I'm not sure that link's correct. But if you go onto the school website, in the learning tab, it comes up in the drop down box. And also the British Dyslexia Association, their website's amazing. And this week is actually um, Dyslexia Awareness Week. Um, so we've had assemblies going on in school. We've had learning champion sessions. But on the BDA website, there's a really good section for parents. A couple of great videos on there as well. Um, and lots of signposting. They also hold a list of um, recognised uh, dyslexia assessors and also dyslexia tutors. Um, so that is quite a good website to, to go to. But if in doubt, ring the office, pop into the office and ask to speak to me. Um, and I always make time for OK, got one video to share and then I'll stop recording. And then if there are any um, questions, you can pop them in the chat. OK, here we go. If you're dyslexic, it's kind of your superpower. It's like the way that you think. Our brains, uh, they're wired to, I think, process information differently. It's just the way that you see the world. I don't think people do think the way I think. And we're curious. Uh, we're creative. The way I see the world might be different from somebody else, but that's valid. In fact, it's vital. The imagination, the storytelling, the communication, the empathy, all these positives. We can simplify things. Uh, we see the big picture. In a world which is pretty competitive, I think to be able to look at it differently is a huge advantage. Dyslexic minds have exactly the skills we need for the workforce of tomorrow. My spelling makes people laugh. It makes me laugh, actually. And my reading, if I'm sight reading, oh, it's, it's a complete joke. School was pretty difficult, to be honest. Um, I wasn't a, a massive fan of the classroom. I used to always hide in the store cupboard. But fortunately, my English teacher knew that that was my spot. <laughs> It was hard for me to focus and concentrate in class. I hated reading. I hated writing. Public reading out loud. Dyslexia can cause real challenges in traditional education. It can be difficult. We're not teaching kids to think. We're teaching kids to pass exams. If education is a challenge for a child with dyslexia, you need to understand how to educate them so that it isn't a challenge. One in five children suffer from dyslexia. That's 20% of the classroom. And yet, teachers aren't trained to recognise it. I think it's vital that teachers are trained about dyslexics. Because the world is changing and, uh, and imagination is key to everything. And there's going to be a lot of kids whose potential are lost unless we train our teachers to effectively teach them. Imagine a world where you've got, you know, a little, where you've got like a force of people who have this gift of dyslexia educated in a way that supports them. It means anything's possible, you know. It means anything is possible. OK. Um, I just wanted to add before I end the recording um, that we have had staff training um, at the start of the Dyslexia Friendly Project a couple of years ago and then throughout that first year and that second year, it was a two year project, we've had, we have regular training sessions with, um, uh, within our staff meetings. So it is something we revisit. And as I said, I had a staff meeting yesterday and we spent a chunk of that time talking about um, dyslexia friendly practice in the classroom. OK, so thank you for listening. I'm going to turn off the record and then if anybody does have anything to say in the chat box, at least um, we, we can have a two way conversation without it being recorded. So I'm just going to click end on record.